brilliant. Thanks very much, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, I can only apologise for being late and on the wrong stage. That was entirely my fault. You must not hold the, the organisers responsible for that at all. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is hacking the spectrum. What I mean by that is how radios being a hardware thing is transitioning into radios being a software thing. And uh, I'll talk a bit about the hardware changes that that involves, what that means. I'm going to talk about how to write the software for radios. And uh, scarily for me, I'm actually going to code a radio live on stage in front of you this afternoon. So what could go wrong? I think nothing could possibly go wrong. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit. I haven't done it yet. Perhaps clap afterwards. Finally, I'm going to talk about what you can do with it. What's the point of it all? Any questions? Good. But first, I want to quickly talk about decimation. It's a word that uh, is used in signal processing. Uh, people often ask me what it means, so I'll get this out of the way. Decimation is from the uh, Latin root, meaning 10. I don't know what the Latin root is, because I didn't go to that kind of school. It does describe a particularly gruesome Roman punishment, though. Uh, if, a, if a general wanted to punish a legion, he would divide the legion up into groups of 10. Each of these groups of 10 would draw lots, and then the, uh, the, the one that drew the shortest lot would be killed by the other nine. So uh, I think it's a, a punishment that was uh, threatened more often than it was used. But in, uh, it, uh, this, this uh, illustration, by the way, is by William Hogarth. It comes from the book, the, 1970, the 1725 classic, Roman Military Punishments, which uh, features on my bookshelf, and I'm sure it does on yours too. But to decimate in this context, the context of single signal processing simply means to throw away or destroy a proportion of whatever it is you're talking about. Right, back onto radios, unless you want to talk more about Roman military punishments. Okay, this is the inside of a traditional radio. If you've ever taken one apart, you'll recognize that immediately. Um, I think the key things to notice about this is from about the 1970s, by the way. It's a Telefunken, very beautiful radio. The key things to notice about it is that everything is done in the hardware. The, uh, it, this is the result of uh, over 100 years of electronics evolution since radio was invented in 1895. It is a brilliant design. These kind of radios are uh, a feature of the combined genius of thousands of engineers and electronics designers. It's a brilliant piece of design, extremely clever, extremely complicated. And how it works is the black ferrite rod at the top sucks in a tiny, very narrow band of the frequency spectrum. That's fed into the electronics, which shifts the frequency, filters it, extracts the audio, filters that, amplifies that, and then puts uh, squirts that out of the loudspeaker you can see on the right. It is, uh, as I say, a brilliant design. Uh, hats off to the thousands of people that came up with that. However, it is complex, as you can see, and relatively expensive to make. Uh, also, it's not particularly amenable to tinkering, which kind of rules it out for people like us, really. By contrast, this is a software-defined radio, which we known by the acronym SDR. And at first sight, you might be forgiven for thinking that that looks like a computer, and you might be right. That's pretty much what it is. Um, how this works is rather than capturing a tiny uh, segment of the radio spectrum, it captures the entire thing up to the limits that it's allowed, that it's able to do so by its design. Typically for one like this, up to about 80 megahertz. That all comes from, in from the antenna. It's then digitized by a super high speed uh, digital to analog, uh, analog to digital converter, excuse me. This, uh, of course, produced mind numbingly large allowance, amounts of data. So then that's paired down by an FPGA. You can see that, that's the big black square at the top of the box. Uh, that pairs it down to a, a smaller amount, the amount we're actually interested in. Um, that all happens under the, control, un on the, under the control of a microprocessor and then it's simply fed out of a USB socket and all of the signal processing is done in software by a host computer. 
hence software-defined radio, rather than the hardware doing the defining of what the radio is all about. So, you may be asking, and I don't blame you, in the words of uh, Miles Davis, so what? So there's a new radio, who cares? So there's more to the story than that, fortunately. In the, I'll take you back to 2008. Digital TV was just taking off. You'll forgive me if I take my glasses off. Can't read a thing with them on. Can't see a thing with them off. So various companies saw an opportunity to launch uh, something to import digital TV signals into computers. Computers were getting fast enough to be able to process those kind of, that kind of data. And... Uh, you know, digital TV signals, by that I mean the stuff that comes in those new aerials or stuff that comes in from satellite dishes. Um, Realtek, the Taiwanese chip manufacturer, launched this. The RTL 2932U. It's uh, an all-in-one digital TV tuner. It's actually a brilliant piece of design, years ahead of its time. Combines tons and tons of functionality on a relatively small piece of silicon. Um, it needs very few other components in order to function. It's basically a system on a chip. And uh, you could, it has, also has a USB port on it. So you could pretty much plug your satellite dish in one side, the USB socket in the other, and lo and behold, uh, with the correct driver, all of your uh, TV pictures would appear inside your computer. Uh, as you can imagine, given how far ahead of its time it was in 2008, they were hugely popular and the, launched a rash of, uh, of uh, laptop TV dongles that you may well remember. The chips uh, sold in there millions and millions. The cost fell virtually to zero, and it was integrated in all kinds of TV equipment. But as I say, it launched a flood of 10 pound or so USB TV dongles uh, that you can still buy to this day. The next player in the story, Osmocom. I don't know if that's a name you've heard of. Osmocom are a very, very interesting group of people. Their uh, USP is to... Uh, develop open source versions of the conspicuously closed source, suspiciously closed source, mobile phone network infrastructure. So they've written a suite of software that uh, replaces all this dodgy stuff with backdoors to foreign governments, and uh, allegedly, and uh, there is really no need now for governments to buy, uh, to buy this kind of equipment manufactured by foreign governments. There's absolutely no need to take a risk. This, the Osmocom stuff has all been verified and is available for, ins for inspection to whoever cares. However, that's a political point. Um, having cracked, so GSM is what mobile phone, the, the, the protocol that mobile phones use. Having cracked GSM, which they have, they then moved on to DECT. DECT is the digital system that digital cordless phones run on, a proprietary closed system for no real reason. They reverse engineered it and produced a suite of software to work interactively so your equipment could uh, work with the, mobile, with the digital mobile phones. Having uh, conquered DECT, they moved on to Tetra. Tetra is what uh, one of the systems that digital walkie-talkies use, especially those used by the police, the fire service, those kind of things. They produced a suite of software, they reverse engineered Tetra, produced a suite of software to interact so you could join in the Tetra, <laughs> the Tetra revolution from your armchair. Having done that, they moved on to Iridium, and that's where they are now. They are reverse engineering the Iridium satellite network and uh, aim to produce a suite of software <laughs> so you can join in the satellite revolution and uh, use the Iridium, the Iridium network from the comfort of your armchair. So, Osmocom, as I say, very interesting group of people. You should get them to give a talk here. These three people in particular looked at the 2932 as part of their deliberations, doing something or other, and wondering if they could use it somehow, because it was so cheap and so powerful, they could use it in uh, one of their systems. And uh, by a really extraordinary piece of reverse engineering, which is really what they're good at, they discovered that you could stick the 2932 into an undocumented test mode. Isn't that great when they bury these undocumented test modes in things? And you could switch off all the digital TV stuff 
and just leave on the software defined radio bit and the USB bit and uh, beam the uh, digital radio signals straight into your computer. And Steve Markraff wrote a driver to do exactly this. And it has to be said, it turned the world of radio upside down. Now, the world of radio is a small world, so you may not have noticed it turning upside down. But to turn upside down, it absolutely did. And uh, because the technology that previously cost thousands of pounds could now be yours for a tenner. And uh, just to say, I've got a couple here to give away at the end. If anybody fancies having a go at this, come and see me afterwards, and I'll give you one of these, uh, one of these dongles. So there are now literally thousands of these kind of dongles on the market. This is typical. It's one I found on eBay that I bought, and I'm going to give to a lucky recipient. As you can see, it's got uh, the black USB stick. It's got a little antenna that comes with it. It's got a CD, rather charmingly, which has got the software on. Oh, a CD. I remember CDs. And it's also got a, a little keypad. God knows what that is. And I've absolutely no intention of installing the software to find out. Uh, it has to be said, for a tenor, you get a device with some limitations. Fine for tinkering, but doing anything serious, you'll bump up against those limitations. So next, the next generation up is this kind of thing. This is from a very, very trusted company called rtlsdr.com. They have redesigned it using a later generation of chips. Uh, many of the limitations of the £10 device are missing. This is £30, so uh, you, know, you get a fit, pretty much a pro device for £30. A word of warning, on the internet, on the eBay especially, there are tons of uh, counterfeit versions of this. Don't buy this from eBay. If you're going to buy it, buy it direct from their website or buy it from a shop, Mauser or something like that. Um, and the top of the range, for £200, you could get something like this. This uh, is completely redesigned. Uh, if you want to do a PhD in software-defined radio, you should buy this. It, uh, as well as having none of the limitations of the other two devices, it also has a transmitter in. Though you'll need a license to use the transmitter, or Ofcom, Ofcom will come and drag you out of your door and uh, lock you up. But that's an absolutely superb device. Um, as I say, PhD level, 200 pounds for a PhD. In America, they pay 500 pounds for a PhD class. So there we are. Uh, so you're, you're wondering now, now that you know all about the hardware, what on earth can it do? Well, if you just want to tinker, there's a ton of free and open source software out there to, avail to enable you to do exactly that. The best, I think, is this, SDR Sharp, um, as in SDR Hash by a company called AirSpy. They give it away and they'll sell you a dongle that it runs very well on, but it'll run on any dongles. And this is a pro-grade piece of gear. This used to cost you £10,000 and you can have it for nothing. And it's absolutely brilliant. And if you just want to explore the radio spectrum, and find out what's going on, I'd suggest you download this. If, however, like me, you want to interact with your hardware a bit more, you will need this new radio. Um, for hackers, it's far more interesting. As you may or may not know, depending on how old you are, the GNU stuff is written by the Free Software Foundation, um, originally set up to write an open source version of Unix, which at the time was incredibly expensive and proprietary. It's still proprietary, but not very expensive. And uh, the Linux kernel started up at, about at opportune time because their own kernel, GNU Herd, uh, was dying the death. So they kind of unofficially joined, <coughs> joined forces with Linux. And uh, in the early days of Linux, it was called GNU Linux, but we seem to have dropped the GNU part now. But pretty much anything that isn't the kernel is GNU. And GNU Radio is effectively a software development kit for any kind of radio project you can imagine. Uh, anything you can dream up, they've probably got some software to help you with. Now, I'll caveat this with saying that writing radio software is a difficult thing to do. Even with GNU Radio, writing software, radio software from scratch is a difficult thing to do. But luckily, part of GNU Radio is the GNU, charmingly called GNU Radio Companion, which is not GNU Radio in you having a fireside chat on a cold wintry night. But I shall show you exactly what it is, if you'll just allow me to 
come out of here. Right. So GNU Radio installs best on Windows or Linux. Don't try and install it on, uh, on Mac because you'll end up with no hair and you still won't have a working GNU radio installation. So um, I've installed it here on Windows. When it's all installed, it's relatively easy to do, though it takes quite a long time. You end up with a GNU radio command prompt with all the correct environment variables set and that kind of thing. You run GNU radio companion like this. It's in Python. Not like, yep, like that. Ugh. This isn't going very well. GNU Radio Companion. No. God, we got there in the end. There's a bit of scrolling at the start. There's always a bit of scrolling with open source stuff. Can't get away from it. And this is the basic GNU Radio screen. This is the program area, and you write programs by connecting these blocks together. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see a menu of all the various kinds of blocks you can get. Um, these are in folders by function. Bottom left-hand corner is the message area where GNU Radio tells you what it's doing. And then here is about setting debug breakpoints and all that kind of stuff. But we won't be doing anything complicated enough to require that. Any, bo any box that has a red title means there's some kind of error. What it's trying to tell me at the moment is that I haven't saved it yet. So I'm going to go and save it. Let's call it. Now, anybody who knows anything at all about uh, programming languages will know the first thing you write in any program language is a Hello World application, uh, which normally prints Hello World on the screen. The Hello World of radio is, is a FM radio, which is the easiest kind of radio to make. So I'm going to, in front of your very eyes, ladies and gentlemen, make an FM radio. I'm going to call it Hello World. There we are. It already exists. Well, not now it doesn't. So you set the parameters in these blocks by double-clicking on the blocks. There we are. Or just right-click and select properties. Um, it set the ID to the name of the program. All of this other stuff I won't need to set here. thing to note is that when you've, when you've got your working um, program... Oh, my God. Hang on, let's start again. I think it's actually run it. When you've got your working program, you can export it in either a Python or a C++ uh, program, which you can then compile or do whatever you want and distribute. So you end up with something that you can then hack and rewrite your interface to. OK, let's save it again. I know we're fine. OK. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, this is how you do a variable in GNU Radio. You have a block, it's called a variable. The sample rate is the sample rate of samples coming in from the USB stick to the uh, computer. I'm going to change that to 2 megahertz. So that's 2 E6. We use scientific notation in this program. And then you can see the variable is set to 2 megahertz. Um, this is the complicated bit, so I'm going to refer to my notes, ladies and gentlemen. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, show you how to... We need, a, we need a tuning slider in order to tune this radio. So they are in GUI widgets. QT is the, is the uh, library du jour, and it's called a QT range. A range is what they call a slider. The ID is the variable name. I'm going to, uh, that's a bit of a mouthful, so I'm going to call it freak. For frequency. Default value is what it's going to start up at. I'm going to pick a random number, 93.3 E6 megahertz. 93.3 megahertz. We're going to look for a radio station in the FM broadcast band. That broadcast band goes from 87 
megahertz to 107 megahertz. This is the slider step, 100 kilohertz seems to work quite well. And that's it. So there's my slider, my tuning slider. Next I need to get some information into the computer from the... What's that? Ah, oh it is. Thank God you spotted that. 100 E3. Thank you. So getting some information into the computer, we use this block here. There we are, RTL SDR source. Things to set here are the frequency. Well, we've got a uh, we've got a variable for that, so I'm going to type in freak, and I'm going to add a little bit of amplification uh, just so as we can hear it. So that's the RF gain to 100 rather than 10. It's red because there's an error. There's an error because it's not connected to anything. So I'm going to connect it to a display. Um, which is going to show us that everything's working correctly, please God. This is the display we use, phosphor sync. I connect the two. I have to change the frequency to freak. Everything is freak. And now if I run it, I sincerely hope that what we shall see is the uh, display showing us the frequency spectrum reassuring us that I've connected everything correctly. There's a little bit of compilation going on here. There's the slider. Right, and there is the display. So if I move this along, you can see various bits of the frequency spectrum. So that gives me some confidence that we're in the right place, we're in the right ballpark. Okay. I'll put this to one side. I need three blocks now to make a radio. The first block is I need something to demodulate the FM signal. Demodulators are in modulators because uh, nothing's ever not confusing. The one I want is wideband FM receive. I'm going to connect the input to that. I'm going to quadrature sample rate is called quadrature rate in uh, demodulators. Come and ask me why if you care. So I'm going to change that to sample rate. Here is decimation. It's asking me if I want to reduce the sample rate. I do, but not yet. So I'm going to put that to one. Again, there's an error because that output isn't connected to anything. That output is orange, which is telling me it's now a float output. Oh my God, five minutes. Right, I better up the pace. So now I need to change the sample rate. I'm going to do that by putting a resample block on. Rational resampler, not because I'm going to invite it around for lunch, but because it's a ratio. So to get from uh, 20 megahertz to 48 kilohertz, which is what I want, I need to multiply by 3 and divide by 125. So interpolation 3. Decimation, 125. So I'm, I'm throwing away 125 out of 126. And finally, I need to squirt it out of the sound card in the computer. I'm going to use an audio sync for that. I'm simply going to connect this to that. I'm going to change the sample rate. It's helpfully given me sample rate, but that's an, an insane suggestion. It's 48 kilohertz. Right, all the red is gone. Um, you and I both know that there's actually nothing could go wrong here, so I'm simply, I'm going to save it and I'm going to run and let's see what happens. It's compiling. Can you bear the suspense? I know I'm struggling. Now, why am I getting no audio out? <laughs> it, may be. it may be because the HDMI might not be configured on this board. Mm. If I see audio coming from you, I will gladly turn up that channel. Okay. Sound settings. Just 
choose where to play sound. I'll tell you what, it's coming out of here, it's coming out of the speaker here now, I'll simply point this microphone out here. And let's tune something in. Thank God for that. The soothing power of music. Okay, so to wrap up, a blistering pace. What can you do with all of this stuff? Well, here are several ideas, and if I had more time, I would demonstrate them to you. You can listen to the archers anywhere in the world, and that's because the uh, BBC transmitter this broadcast on, which is on uh, 198 kilohertz, the long wave broadcast, is a whopping 500 kilowatt, uh, megawatts. No, sorry, 500 kilowatts, <laughs> nearly a megawatt, well, 500 megawatts, that would be quite something. Now, having that reach is quite useful, as the government noticed, something you can hear everywhere in the world um, has other uses than listening to the archers on. So the government have buried inside that signal a, uh, a uh, data signal. It's not secret, but people don't really talk about it. It's, it's encoded using an encoding technique called PSK. There are blocks in GNU radio to decode it. Why not have a listen, find, have a look, find out what that is and what it's for. Weather satellites, there are a ton of weather, weather satellites either in geostationary orbit or in low earth orbit. And uh, you can, uh, the, we have blocks in GNU radio to decode the images. And in fact, GNU radio runs on a Raspberry Pi and those kind of embedded devices. You could make a little embedded device running GNU radio to download satellite images and beep them to your telly when you're not watching anything else. Or this, this is uh, a radio antenna, for a radio astronomy antenna. You can go to opensourcetelescopes.org get the plans to build something like this, plug it into your computer, and uh, GNU Radio contains all the uh, software you need to run it and contribute, actively contribute to uh, rate the, finding out the origins of the universe using radio astronomy. So um, I said in the, in the beginning of my talk, it's surprising what you can do. I think it's surprising because pretty much everything's got a radio in these days and uh, all the information is simply floating around in the air, ready to be plucked and uh, limited only by your imagination. And as you only need to be a software person now, not a hardware person to make radios, there's no excuse for any of us not doing that. And that is the end of my talk. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Questions outside. Uh, if you do, and, or if you want a dongle, come and see me outside. I'll be standing over there.